We've been told there are festivals we can't play and organizations we can't join because we're not bluegrass. And conversely, we've been told, like, why doesn't the real family, why aren't we allowed to play more square dances? Because we're not old timey enough, so. I guess the term I'm most comfortable with is country music. I just, you know, I love Hank Williams, I love Johnny Cash, but I also really love Frank Prophet and Clarence Ashley and Doc Watson, and I also like Bill Monroe, and, and I'm happy to play all of their songs. That's just the folk tradition, is you just take other people's stuff and you bring it, you bring it up to today. And I ain't got no use for corruption. And I ain't got no use for your party. Kim and I, we both worked for the St. Louis Park School District, and I ended up uh, subbing in Kim's classroom. I, I asked Colin out on a date. I wrote a little note that said, I'd like to make you dinner sometime. And I put it into his, his car window. His, his sunroof was open, and I threw it in there. So a couple weeks went by, and I wrote him another little note that said, hey, I'd love to make dinner for you sometime. Never called me. I think you even confronted me once, like, hey, did you get those letters I wrote you? I don't remember that. You probably went, oh. Uh. But yeah, you finally came into my room and, and asked me out. But by then, my, the, the kids in my class knew that I really liked you. And so when you left, ooh. And these are like five-year-olds, you know? I mean, these are little kids. And they started singing Kim and Quillen, sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S, <laughs> I-N-G. We got married in the spring of 2003. Mm -hmm. And pretty much like the, the next day, Kim says, hey, let's start a band together. And I kept saying, oh, it's such a bad idea. Such a bad idea. But that summer, June Carter Cash died. And then that fall, uh, Johnny Cash died. And so uh, Lee's Liquor Lounge, which is a great country bar in town, they were putting together uh, a tribute to John and June. 
and I really wanted to do it, so I, I asked her while she was watching TV in the other room while I had the booker on the phone and said, hey, can we, can, do you still want to start a band together? And she said, yeah, and that was it. <laughs> White horse? Huh, okay. We'll do it. We'll do it. The 331 Club used to be a really scary meth biker bar. And we got a phone call from Rob Rule. I remember him calling and saying, hey, um, I know you've got this new band. Would you guys want to come down and play? Cool. Said I'm not bringing my wife there. <laughs> yeah, as he told me where it was. I said I'm not bringing her there. That's not. That's not safe. That's a terrible place. He says, No, 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 no. I know what you're thinking. They've got new owners. And so we went down there and we played it and we left. And Kim said we should do a weekly show there. Yeah, we just had an open door policy. Just hey, bring your instrument. 
come on down, come play. We've had a lot of people sit in with us over the years, a lot of cool We've players. had a vibraphone. Recorder. And a recorder. Harmonium, the keyboard that you squeeze. We had a broom player. <laughs> Quillen and I met at the St. Paul Art Crawl. I wandered in and he said, hey, and I said, hey, and he said, come down to the gig, and um, that's how he's been collecting band members. He just tells people, come down to the gig, and they become band members. Quillen and Kim came by the house once to borrow some microphones for a show, and I was out in the garage building a mandolin, and Quillen said, when you get done building that thing, bring it down and pick with us. And I said, oh, I couldn't. He said, oh, you could. I said, oh, okay, I did. And so I've been doing it with him for about 12 years now. We were just at a party in a backyard, and they said they needed a fiddle player. And I said, okay, I'll show up. And I sat in that chair now for about 438 Mondays. So we started playing the 331 in 2005. And we've missed? Three. Three? The band as a whole has missed three Mondays in 12 years. Both pregnancies, Kim played right up until we had the kid. I mean, it wasn't a stage birth or anything, but it was, we were, we were playing <laughs> every Monday at the 331 Club, and, and Elle was born on Tuesday. Two years ago now, Kim and I were gonna quit. We were done with it, but the rest of the band did not agree. We never rehearsed, so they, were, they said, this is, this is rehearsal, like, and we're getting paid to rehearse. Why would we ever give this up? I think there is something magical about the 331. You know, it's where we were born, you know, as a band. Everybody makes Monday nights, unless there's something really big going on with the family. Everybody makes Monday nights because it's church, you know. One, two, three, four. Rick Lee on the fiddle. Kim Rowe dancing for you there, friends. I consider the, the saw to be um, kind of like the icing on the cake. It's, it's, um, it's not an instrument that is contributing to the structure of the tune so much as an instrument that is just adding a little embellishment and a little emphasis here and there. First of all, to play, you need to have the saw bent in an S shape, which I'll kind of exaggerate a little bit. 
And what you're doing there is you're kind of constricting a portion of the saw blade that's vibrating. And then as you bend more, you get higher notes. And as you bend less, you get lower notes. It's really, it's not unlike a tuba or a trombone. It's all about embouchure. So you would play, if you were gonna play a bottle, you would blow over it like this. But you only get one note, unless you fill the, the bottle with different amounts of water. You know, in order to get two or three octaves out of a, out of a jug, uh, you tighten or loosen your lips. I won't follow the bass, but we will definitely play off of one another. You know, I'm primarily rhythm, I guess, but Quillen likes to throw a jug solo in, you know, every now and then, just to keep my life interesting. Some of our songs are a little more traditionally jug songs, you know, and jug music than others. So they have big spaces for jug solos. Yeah, if you don't want jug players to be around, you don't hire a saw player, I guess. Yeah, that's the lesson here. <laughs> if you don't want jug players around you, don't hire a don't saw hire player. Yeah, because the... Adam, Adam was the one who hired both saw players. Our saw player or brought in all brought of in, our jug yeah. players. Because he's like, I'm naked here with a saw, yeah. I need a jug behind yeah. me. We need more circus instruments. <laughs> would hold on to your ears. And she still does it today does at eight. <laughs> we had friends, musician friends, who would always refer to her as Mama Ro. Or, um, you know, because it was just, it was so much of, of who we were and who Kim was. It was, you know, being a mom on stage. I'd put him in the Baby Bjorn first, right? Mm -hmm. And so Oni would be in front, and then Elle still wanted Mama to hang on to her. And that was... So Elle would be in the backpack. Yep. So She'd would... have both kids. It was... it was fun. I really liked that. <laughs> yeah, she'd probably still be back there if I wouldn't have kicked her out.
we do a lot of a lot of kids shows, a lot of family shows, and we I think we learn something new every time. Just I mean, just looking out in the crowd and you see these little tiny kids just moving around, squirrely. All right, let's get up and stretch. Let's do this. Let's sing a song together. We thought, well, that's something we can do, and it's a kind of an underserved market, and there's not a lot of good kids' music that parents like to listen to, as we discovered as new parents. But we don't want to be labeled as kids' musicians either. There's, you know, there's more to who we are and what we do than just being kids' musicians. Kim and I have been doing this uh, full time now for five years, um, so. It's very, you know, it has become sadly about the economics of, you know, this gig plays this much, that guarantees this many people this much money. Um, every time we limit the number of people that are on a gig because of how much we can pay, I feel like I just sold out a little bit. I feel like I'm letting commerce dictate to art. And I don't like that. I mean, it's, it's real. I've got two kids, we got a house, we got cars, we got payments. I, we have to do it, but I don't like it. Oni, do you have rent? A whole bunch of people kept telling us, you guys should really apply for a McKnight Fellowship. <laughs> the McKnight Foundation is a group that gives out fellowships to artists. To me, like real disciplines. I mean, I literally had the feeling like, man, we just play old time music. I mean, I believe in it, but it didn't seem like something that would be worthy of this massive fellowship. And so then we got the call that we had won that, and it was, it was unbelievable. For me, it made me feel like a real artist. I mean, I felt like, wow, this is a legitimate thing, and, and uh, we're not just, this wasn't a fluke. You know, these people appreciate it. And taking the award money, that's when we decided to leave our day jobs. I've never held a check for that amount for. The funny thing, of course, is how quickly that money goes away, especially Family before um, we didn't have insurance for that first year, and the vast majority of that money went to, went to health care. I don't think we could do what we do now, full time, like we still do it, if it wasn't for the help of my parents, who live with us, and then the Affordable Care Act. Like Those two things are what make us, keep us able to do what we do.
Thank you very much. Thank you, friends. This program is made possible by the state's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.